After Roosevelt is successfully re-elected for a third term, he decides he's going to take a vacation aboard a naval ship. And so he goes out in the Caribbean, and he sits on the deck, and he goes fishing, and he looks out at the water, and he just thinks. By then, England desperately needed our weapons to fight back against Germany. And it looks as though Hitler might very well win. And if the Germans take control of Britain, then Germany will reign supreme basically from Poland to the Atlantic Ocean. And Churchill, he can't hold out much longer. They're broke. Winston always exaggerates. Yes. But this feels different. That damn neutrality law has us in a box. Damn it. Let me yours, huh? A moment ago, I was out of fluid. So you let me use your lighter. I needed it. You let me use it. So we give Churchill tanks and planes instead of selling them. Last time I checked, that would be illegal too. No, we don't give them tanks and planes. We lend them. FDR was canny and cunning, and he knew how to get things done through sleight of hand. And this worked for him perfectly on what we came to call Lend-Lease. Because the Allies can't pay for anything, we can lend them military hardware, we can lend them supplies, and at some unspecified point in the future, they can pay for them. And he has a wonderful metaphor for it. He says if your neighbor's house catches on fire, you're going to loan him your garden hose to put it out. And you're not going to charge for it. When they started the Lend-Lease debate in the Congress, it wasn't clear it could get through. But Roosevelt was always moving step by step to get the American public educated as to where they had to go. First, in late December, he gives a fireside chat. We must have more ships, more guns, more planes, more of everything. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. He said if we produced these ships and tanks and weapons and planes and got them to England, and England was able to fight back against Germany, maybe that would prevent us from getting into the war. And then on January 6, 1941, FDR is delivering a State of the Union. And he centers a speech around values, these four principles, these four freedoms. And he says everyone is entitled to freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Where do you stand? Who are we going to be? And when you put it that way, but of course, you're going to bring the country with you. And it worked. Congress said yes. And so this allows for billions of dollars of greatly needed supplies, not only to go to Great Britain, but go to many other allied powers to be able to withstand the onslaught from the Axis powers. Because of FDR's leadership, Lend-Lease was able to really have an enormous impact in that war. June of 1941, Hitler orders German troops to attack the Soviet Union. More than two million men plunged into a front 2,000 miles long. Before all this began, the United States was suspicious of the communists of the Soviet Union. But now the Soviet Union is fighting against Germany. Now, that changes things. Churchill famously says, if Hitler invaded hell, I'd support the devil. But how can we give arms or aid to Soviet Russia, where Joseph Stalin purges, kills, exiles hundreds of thousands, so he reigns supreme? FDR doesn't know much about Stalin. Stalin's crimes are not well publicized. And so FDR sends Harry Hopkins, his great friend and envoy and all-purpose aide, to meet Stalin and take the measure of him. And Hopkins comes back and reports to FDR that Stalin is somebody you can do business with. He's not presenting him as the great terrorist, the great killer. 
And so FDR is going to argue immediately to extend Lend-Lease aid to the Soviet Union. As German armies advanced east, they committed unspeakable genocidal war crimes against Jews as they found them in Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, parts of the Soviet Union. And most of these killings were done by special units of SS Gestapo personnel who were killing Jews with bullets, killing them in any way that they could. At a meeting outside of Berlin, which takes all of about 90 minutes, including breakfast, the Germans decide that the final solution to the Jewish question will be the mass murders of Jews. In the summer of 1941, FDR and Churchill decide it's time for them to meet face to face. So he announces at a press conference that he's going to be cruising up the Atlantic seaboard in the presidential yacht. Sure enough, he waves to the people on the shoreline. And that night, he's transferred to the USS Augusta and heads up for a secret rendezvous with Winston Churchill in Placentia Bay in Newfoundland. Churchill, meanwhile, crosses the German submarine-infested North Atlantic to meet with Roosevelt. The Augusta is at anchor and literally out of the fog emerges this great British battleship, the HMS Prince of Wales. There was an incredible moment that these two leaders were in this place at that time. Glad to have you aboard, Mr. Churchill. At long last, Mr. President. The fate of the world did depend on this relationship between the two men. We're ready to carry on alone, if we must. I'm committed to sending everything you need. In my view, you're fighting for all of us now. Of course, I'd rather have a declaration of war from America now and no supplies for six months, then double the supplies and no declaration. You know, Winston, that Congress declares war, not me. And I'm on thin ice with them. There's nothing I'd like better than to kick Hitler in the teeth. You know that. But timing is everything. Yes. Yeah. Timing. Churchill was the suitor. FDR was the pursued. Winston Churchill once said, no lover ever studied the whims of his mistress as I did those of Franklin Roosevelt's. Churchill was not an elusive figure. You knew what he was thinking, sometimes to a fault. FDR was ironic, flexible, slippery in a way. But they needed each other. What about Japan? Suppose they attack one of our colonies in Asia. Oh, one of yours. America doesn't have colonies. <laughs> the Philippines, Guam. Call them what you like. Territory under your control. And FDR was incredibly frustrating to Churchill. Churchill is fighting for his life, for the life of constitutional democracy. And FDR is incredibly elusive. If Japan does something like that, I'll have to respond, of course. But it's my opinion that would be the wrong war at the wrong time in the wrong place. I agree. Europe comes first. Churchill's dreams since he was a little boy and his ideas of heroism are often about saving something from collapse, about saving the world as he knows it from disaster. Meanwhile, Roosevelt is not an imperialist. He is someone who is extremely idealistic politically. And rather than wanting to save something historic in the past, he really is looking to the future and he wants to build something new. Then the next morning, Roosevelt gets himself over to the Prince of Wales ship. The sailors are all there, the British and American sailors. It's an incredible moment. And they sing hymns together. 
And somehow that got to Roosevelt, the same language, the same values, the same hymns. Afterward, he turns to his son and said, if nothing else had happened while we were here, that would have cemented us. The two of them become more than partners, more than allies. They become friends in a very deep way. They share this passion for naval history. They share this ability to understand the global picture. FDR said to Churchill, it's fun to be in the same decade with you. Churchill said about FDR, meeting him was like opening your first bottle of champagne, in Churchill's case of the day. They disagree fundamentally on colonialism and the fate of the British Empire, but they draft the Atlantic Charter, which is this extraordinary statement that says, here are the values that we believe are worth fighting for. I think it was the most important diplomatic friendship in the history of the world. Roosevelt and Churchill were unique. Their challenges were unique, and they rose to the occasion together.